All right. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, just to let you know um, that the Secretary General's report on special measures for protection from sexual exploitation and abuse is out today as a document. It should be up if it is not already up already on the uh, UN documents website. As you know, this is the annual update, uh, which looks back at 2018 on our efforts to prevent and respond to sexual exploitation and abuse in line with the Secretary General's strategy on this. Um, just to give you a quick update on the progress made, in 2018, the Clear Check tool was launched to ensure that perpetrators of sexual exploitation and abuse are not rehired in any part of the United Nations. UN entities are now part, uh, 29 UN entities are now participating in this. We also have developed the Incident Reporting Forum, which is designed to minimize the number of times a victim or witness is interviewed and standardize the complaint intake, intake process across the UN system. There's also a centralized tool to track victims' assistance that is being rolled out in peace operations. We have a protocol on implementing partners, which includes strong provisions of victims' rights. These are just a few examples of the long-term effort, which, as you know, we continue to work on to fight this scourge of exploitation and abuse. Uh, and you saw that yesterday we issued two separate statements by the Secretary General in which he expressed his sadness at the loss of life, destruction of property, and displacement of people by tropical cyclone Idai in Zimbabwe and by flash floods, landslides, and an earthquake in Indonesia. He extends his condolences to the families of the victims of both tragedies and to the people and government of Zimbabwe and Indonesia. Both statements are available online. On Cyclone Idai, our humanitarian colleagues report that in Mozambique, widespread damage is reported in Beira City, with at least 48 people reportedly killed. In Malawi, it has affected more than 183,000 people, while 9,600 people in Zimbabwe have been impacted due to flooding and landslides. The UN and our humanitarian partners are supporting the government-led relief efforts. Further, on the dis disaster in Indonesia, uh, we are told that heavy rains in Papua since March 16th have resulted in at least 79 deaths, with dozens more missing or injured. The government is leading relief efforts with assistance from the National Red Cross and other national NGOs. Uh, west, uh, in West Nusa Tenggara province, two earthquakes yesterday triggered landslides, killing three people and nearly injuring nearly 200 others. And the Secretary General's Special Representative for the Democratic Republic of Congo, of the Congo, Leila Zarugi, is here in New York, where she briefed the Security Council this morning. She said the electoral process in the country was a decisive step towards the consolidation of the rule of law and democracy. She said the new president had, during his first public intervention, also said he wanted to work towards this consolidation and followed the statements of intentions by concrete acts such as the release of political prisoners. Ms. Arugi said despite these opportunities to achieve lasting peace and security in the country today, she remained concerned about several developments in the eastern DRC. She highlighted the situation in North and South Kivu, where she said structural violence was profoundly entrenched. North Kivu's Grand Nord region is also where the second largest Ebola outbreak in history is ongoing. She encouraged the Council to continue to support the consolidation of what has been achieved in the country in recent months and to support the DRC in addressing the threats to peace and security which remain. And Ms. Zarugi has told us that she will take your questions at the stakeout at the end of consultations. Also on the DRC, the Emergency Relief Coordinator Mark Lokok and the UNICEF Executive Director Henrietta Four, um, as well as the Secretary General of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, started a joint mission there to show international solidarity with the Congolese people and demonstrate the willingness of humanitarian actors to work jointly with the government to the dire humanitarian needs. The delegation met earlier today with the new Congolese President, uh, Felix Chik and highlighted the visible progress made in various areas. They also met with the Ministries of Cooperation, Humanitarian Action, and Health. And on Mali, the, report, the UN mission there reports that yesterday unidentified assailants attacked a Malian Armed Forces camp in Dura in northwest Mopti town at the center of the country. The assailants caused numerous casualties and burned down the camp before fleeing. 
The mission organized uh, the medical evacuation and of the injured soldiers. The Secretary General Special Representative Mahatma Saleh Anadif condemned the terrorist attack in the strongest terms and offered his heartfelt condolences to the government of Mali, to the people of Mali, and to the families and relatives of the soldiers who lost their lives. He also reiterated the UN mission's support for the Malian government and to the Malian people in their quest for peace and stability. The um, Special Envoy for Syria, Ger Peterson, is visiting Damascus, where he's held constructive discussions with the Foreign Minister, Walid al-Mualem, in the framework of implementation of Security Council Resolution 2254. Mr. Peterson indicated that the work is progressing and that he looks forward to further discussions. Over the weekend, we issued a statement of the start of the ninth year of the Syria conflict, in which the Secretary General issued four urgent appeals to all parties. First, he urged all sides to maintain their commitment to and uphold the ceasefire arrangements in Idlib. Second, he said, were any form of military operation by any actors contemplated, planned, or executed, exec or I can't pronounce this word, planned or exec executed, thank you. You know, it's the, the <laughs> emphasis needed on certain words in the English language will trip a Frenchman any time, even if he's been speaking English for 40 years. Anyway, thank you. Um, let's try that again. Uh, we won't try that again. Um, third, he emphasized, that the, he emphasized that sustained humanitarian access remains critical with 11.7 million people in need of protection and assistance. Fourth, he said strengthened international support is urgently required if the parties to the conflict are to seriously move towards finding a political solution that meets the legitimate aspirations of all Syrians. And Nikolai Mladenov, the special coordinator for the Middle East peace process, strongly condemned the campaign of arrests and violence used by Hamas security forces against protesters, including women and children in Gaza over the past days. He was particularly alarmed by the brutal beating of journalists and staff from the Independent Commission for Human Rights and the raiding of homes. Mr. Mladenov said yesterday that the long-suffering people of Gaza were protesting dire economic situation and demand an improvement in their quality of life in the Gaza Strip, and it is their right to protest without fear of reprisal. His statement is online. And the Africa Climate Week kicked off today in the, in the capital, uh, the Ghanaian capital of Accra, with policymakers, private sectors, and other stakeholders meeting to share best practices, success stories, and learning points to advance national climate plans. Hosted by the government of Ghana and co-organized by a number of UN and international partners, the event aims to support the implementation of countries' efforts to reduce national emissions and adapt the impact of climate change. Africa Climate Week, which runs until the 22nd of March, is the first of three regional climate weeks in the build-up to the UN Climate Conference COP25, which is scheduled to take place in Chile in December. More information online. Um, and after we hear from, uh, I take your questions, we hear from Monica at 3 p.m. There will be a briefing here by the Deputy uh, Permanent Representative of the Russian Federation, Dmitry Polyansky, in this very room. Edie. Uh, thank you, Steph. Um, the President of Mozambique has said that the death toll from the cyclone could mm -hmm. reach 1,000, and the Red Cross has said 90% of the port of Beira mm -hmm. has been destroyed. What specifically is the United Nations doing uh, to deal with sure. the we're, impact? We're working uh, with the government as this government-led uh, uh, process, but I will try to get you some granularity, which you rightly deserve to have. Michelle. Thanks, Steph. Um, we saw your statement on Friday about the attacks in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Has the SG spoken with Prime Minister Arden over the weekend? And um, this attack has sort of sparked a debate about who's to blame and the rhetoric that's being espoused by people around the world. Does the SG have any thoughts on what can be done Look, uh, about this? I don't think he was able to connect with the Prime Minister over the weekend, uh, but let me, I'll double check. The issue, uh, first of all, I think the person to blame is the person that pulled the trigger, is the first person responsible uh, for this heinous, heinous act. Uh, the Secretary General has been uh, troubled 
and has expressed his trouble publicly uh, at the rising level of hate speech, uh, which has can, can and could have an impact on the violence uh, that we have seen. Uh, this is one of the reasons he has tasked uh, Adama Dieng uh, to put together a, uh, a proposal on how to uh, look and how to deal uh, with hate speech, but this is something that uh, he has, uh, you know, the issue of the, the demonizing of the other, uh, of putting blame uh, on the other, the foreigner, the immigrant, someone who doesn't look like, like you, is something that has concerned him and continues to trouble him greatly. Follow up. Senora, I'll, I'll come back to you in two seconds. Thank you, Steph. Uh, the New York Times uh, published a report over the weekend about the um, usage of Cuban doctors in Venezuela to pressure patients and use medicines as a tool of political pressure to vote for Maduro. Um, is that something, reports like this, the Cuban government has denied it, the government of Venezuela has not responded, um, but they said that this is an organized and uh, specifically not just one doctor, but several doctors have claimed that that's something they have done, even going door to door to tell patients and to influence elderly patients to make sure that they vote for Maduro if they want their medicine to continue and even using oxygen as one of the tools. Um, is any concerns by the Secretary General? We, we, we've, we've seen the report. We obviously have no info detailed information one way or another on the, on the veracity of it. As a matter of principle, it is clear that uh, medical aid, humanitarian aid should be uh, free of any political or any other kind of pressure. Errol. Uh, yeah, just a follow-up uh, quick on Michelle's question and point, of course. Um, in this particular case in New Zealand, the killer, who is obviously to be blamed, first and foremost, uh, but he used uh, as an inspiration particular person, actually on his arms they were inscribing names of the Serbian nationalists and the government of Bosnia, Croatia, Serbia, uh, and uh, Bulgaria and Romania, actually, if I'm not wrong, they are now seeing the route that he was uh, routing, actually traveling to this country a year ago. So why Secretary General in this particular case is somehow, through you, hesitating to name and shame? We, we have no particular insight on the mindset of the killer. Right? We will leave that uh, to the investigators. The Secretary General has been and has publicly, very vocally expressed his uh, concern about the rate, the, the, the rise of, of hate speech, the risks that poses, and we've, we're, we're, we're seeing it, uh, we're seeing it these, these days very clearly. Um, and he is also, uh, you know, it is also clear that um, I think if you look at many of these incidents, uh, of these terrorist attacks. They have been fueled by warped ideologies on all sides of the spectrum. But uh, as I said, we, we, we're not involved in the, in the investigation, so I have no insight uh, other than what I read in the press. Yeah. And Thank then we'll you, Stefan. Today marks the fifth anniversary of uh, illegal annexation of Crimea. Uh, by the Russian Federation. NATO, the EU, and many other countries already made their uh, public statements condemning the Russian Federation for occupying part of the Ukrainian territory. In this uh, regard, I would like to ask you if, there, if the Secretary General is going to publicly denounce Crimea's illegal annexation in its fifth anniversary and come up with any kind of statements? The Secretary General's uh position on, on Ukraine uh, has been unchanged, which is it's guided by uh, the relevant General Assembly resolutions on the territorial integrity of the Ukraine. Uh, he's always uh, been a strong supporter uh, of the efforts of various groups, the Normandy Four, trilateral contact groups, and, and OSCE in trying to resolve the issue. Uh, thank you, Steph. I have uh, two questions. First, uh, uh, on Venezuela. 
Yesterday, fighting broke between uh, Nicolás Maduro supporters and uh, uh, figures who uh, go with uh, the opposition, and it happened in front of a hospital as the commission sent by uh, High Commissioner Michel Bachelet was uh, going to assess the situation there. In the past, the SG has been consistent on calling for dialogue and for alleviating tensions. However, what's brewing on the streets does not reflect that call. So what's the view of the Secretary? Well, Secretary General continues, uh, and various people uh, in this building continues to have contacts with various uh, various parties. I think the incidents that we see uh, only reinforces the need for a political dialogue and for the need for leaders uh, both in, inside uh, Venezuela and outside Venezuela to do whatever they can to lower the tensions. And uh, so yep. uh, the other one is on uh, uh, Colombia. It's on a development that it's uh, going on today. And it's around the debate on the special jurisdiction mm -hmm. for peace. So after the current Colombian government expressed its objections to six of the paragraphs, uh, supporters of the uh, transitional justice mechanism, they have voiced their support. And the division has grown so much that, uh, ER, that people are even taking it to the streets today protesting mm -hmm. for this mechanism to be uh, uh, protected. So uh, this issue seems to be creating a lot more tension in Colombia. So. I mean, the, you know, Secretary General has expressed his uh, his feeling of the importance of the special uh, jurisdiction. Uh, he said so uh, directly uh, in the meeting with the uh, with the Foreign Minister of Colombia, and obviously feels that uh, people should have the right to demonstrate peacefully. Stefano, thank you, Stefan. Um, human rights uh, and lawyer activist um, Nas Nas Nasrin uh, Sotudeh in uh, Iran. She's been uh, recently condemned on a combined 30, 38 years in prison and also 148 lashes. Now, did there any other organization that tried to uh, public opinion know about this? Like, uh, for example, one is Amnesty International contacted the Secretary General to have support or help in uh, in resolve this issue. This is a lawyer that usually defend uh, human rights activists, and uh, she's now in the in a in a very very dangerous situation in a prison uh, in Iran. We've had contacts uh, with Iranian authorities on a number of uh, of human rights uh, related cases. Thank you. So, Monica, but can you can you be more specific no. on this specific no. case? Monica. Oh, sorry, Edie, and then we'll go. Uh, thank you, Stefan. The Chinese government published a report today uh, saying that since uh, 2014, it has arrested 13,000 people in Xinjiang mm -hmm. whom it called terrorists and said that uh, they had curbed religious extremism. Uh, does the Secretary General have any comment on this? Uh, we are trying to get a copy of the of the white paper in, and to take a look at it and study it. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Stefan. Yes, okay. <laughs> always the last one. Okay, the, the question is about the Human Rights Commission is in Venezuela. Uh -huh. When the report will be available? And my question is, the places where this commission visit Venezuela it was selected by the commission itself or by the invitation was been by the Nicolas Maduro government? Uh, obviously, the, the mission is ongoing. Uh, the team was scheduled and if not, has already met with government officials, representative National Assembly, civil society, organizations, victims of human rights violations. Uh, they'll be, they were supposed to go to Caracas and other cities. The, the mission will end, as far as I understand it, around the 22nd. Uh, of March, uh, and I'm sure they visited the places they wanted to go to. Thank you. And I'm not aware of them reporting, I'm not aware of any official report, but you should check with our human rights okay. colleagues. When I ask is, uh, which places they're visiting, it's because there are many reports about saying that uh, Nicolas Maduro sent a uh, his part of his government to fix hospitals in exactly where the human rights were sure. planning to visit. But, uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a question itself. you need to address to our human rights colleagues in Geneva. Right, thank thank you. you. 